post on Change Your Voice, Change Your Life. Voices, that's the title of the program, Voices. We have strange voices. We wake up in the morning, we talk like that, or we talk like this. We don't know what to make of voices, yet voices are the thing. They represent us throughout the day. We are our voices, or do you doubt that? When you talk like that, is that your voice? Does that say hello for you? Does it really get you heard like to listen to? Do you have a voice that doesn't talk for you? Is it a medical problem? Is it pathological? Is it physiological? Is it psychological? Is it emotional? Do you have different voices for different people? Does your voice change throughout the day? Do you know anything about your voice? Join with me. We have Joe Burke. He's an MD, head and neck division, UCLA Medical Center. We're going to talk about voices. We may have divergent points of view, but I think it's interesting to follow what voices are about. Welcome to Change Your Voice, Change Your Life, Joe Burke. Thanks, Dr. Cooper. We are working together now at UCLA on some studies. We have a uh, s small study going on there, as you know, uh, studying some uh, patients with spastic dysphonia to see the efficacy of voice therapy. Mm -hmm. Your position on spastic dysphonia, spastic dysphonia incidentally is it's the ch uh, strangled voice. It's when you hear it, you know you've heard that voice. When you first heard that word, that voice, what impression did you have first hearing it? Well, you, you certainly wonder what could be causing something like that because uh, in just looking at the, the vocal folds in their resting breathing position, they look entirely normal. Mm -hmm. And when you ask the patient to, to phonate or to make a sound, uh, the larynx seems to close up very tightly, uh, act as a very tight sphincter preventing the, the airflow from coming through the, the larynx. Mm -hmm. The larynx is at the fifth and sixth cervical vertebrae of the neck, and the voice is built on a megaphone basis from the top of your eyebrows down to the fifth and sixth cervical vertebrae. There are seven cervical vertebrae, and the larynx is over here at the fifth and sixth cervical vertebrae. And you're seeing a closure at this level when you look down. You're looking down by a mirror or by a video? Either one. You can either use a mirror to look at the voice with, or you can use a, uh, a scope that has a little right angle mirror at the end of it, and you can put it on TV, TV and look at it later on. And you see the closure? Right. What is the view that medics have? Basically, the medics believe it's neurological. Well, I don't think anybody knows entirely for sure what causes that type of, of picture, although patients that typically present with spastic dysphonia have some other neurologic findings that go with it. They frequently have tremors. Mm -hmm. They may have spasticity of a number of their facial muscles. Mm -hmm. And so uh, given that piece of information along with the, the, the picture that we see, one has to assume that it's probably somewhere in the brainstem level that's mm -hmm. causing a, some type of misfiring. Mm -hmm. As I said, we have a diversion position. I accept uh, the position that you maintain. I also take the position that it's basically a voice problem and that the patients who are showing this spasticity are squeezing from the lower throat and they don't know how to use the voice and that it is not a neurological problem, but it's a voice problem with psychological overtones. That's the interesting view of 20 years of experience. Now, at UCLA, I was there from 1960 to 69. We never had one success using these interdisciplinary ramifications approach that the Mayo Clinic uh, suggests we use. And by direct voice rehabilitation, since 1969, I've been successful by focusing the voice up here and taking the pressure away from the lower throat with the breathing. I think some patients do very well with uh, voice therapy. Clearly, there's a, uh, a large subset of patients who have quote unquote spastic dysphonia or hyperfunctional dysphonia that, when treated with voice therapy, do very well. There are other patients, as we've discussed on other occasions, that do very poorly with mm -hmm. voice therapy. And I think those are patients that are usually amenable to forms of uh, medical or surgical therapy. Conversely, there are patients that don't do well with medical or surgical therapy, and those are the ones that frequently do better with voice therapy. Now, there is a difference I do want to point out to the audience. I do not do voice rehab. I do direct voice rehab, and it's a school 
of thinking and approach that is completely different than what is. And for the past 20 years, that's what I've been doing. You get the voice focused up here, step one. Get the pitch, and then get the breathing and those sequences usually, and then change the image. The image of the individual is often quite amiss. They want to squeeze them. So you have to get them up here, and you have to change the identification. That's the psychological and emotional attribute. I've been reporting success for 20 years with spastic dysphonia by direct voice rehab. I've been to peer review, I've been to Cedar sinai recently, I've been to the American Speech and Hearing Association. Yet, the field still maintains that spastic dysphonia is basically a hopeless problem and that the invasive approaches, surgery and now the boculinum. The boculinum is a toxic substance put into the vocal fold area to deaden the recontinental nerve and it creates a temporary paresis or paralysis so that you have a, an impaired voice. Well, uh, let me just give you my opinion on that. I think that um, about Five or ten years ago, as you well know, there were some uh, very well-known physicians that were uh, trying to cut the nerve to the vocal fold as a therapy. And um, in, a lar in large groups of patients, th they had pretty good success for about three years, and then a lot of the symptoms returned. Um, the reason for the, the return of the, the spastic uh, findings is not re really clear, although it, it appears that the the remaining cord that normally moves um, has a tendency to become spastic um, and, and cause the problem again. Um, they had been using botulinum toxin for about 10 years for essential blepharospasm and for other peripheral neuromuscular spastic disorders such as torticollis where patients' heads are kind of cocked over and finding very good results. And the NIH ran a study about two or three years ago uh, injecting botulinum toxin into the vocal folds. Botulinum toxin basically prevents the uh, nerve from uh, uh, exciting the muscles so that the muscles can't contract. Um, when injected into the proper place in the larynx, the larynx still moves normally, although much of the tension in the vocal folds is removed and it allows patients to speak really quite normally. Unfortunately, the toxin only lasts anywhere from about three to six months, um, and it can have some side effects associated with it, such as a real breathy voice if too much is injected or some problems in swallowing. Um, and there's a very small chance that patients could have some type of allergic reaction to it. But by and large, um, it seems to be well tolerated. It has just been released by the Federal Drug uh, Administration for use for spastic dysphonia. Now, I've seen some of these patients, and I've seen the fallout. The literature simply is, is saying that there are side effects, long-term side effects we do not know about. And I think these are some of the issues that the patient should be told, uh, taught and told. They're not aware of the downside effect. And what are these downside effects? With an extraneous substance into the body, the cumulative effects as well. These are the issues, I think, that have to come to the fore and that are not really presented. There's another aspect of the botulinum, and it's this. They're using a, an approach which says that after they paralyze the cord, or create a temporary paralysis or paresis is a small paralysis. They're saying, in, in essence, that the voice itself will find its own level, that it won't be spastic, and that they, if it continues to be spastic, they will re-inject this cord until it, quote, unquote, is relaxed, which means it's paralyzed in a permanent position or some kind of position where it's off the center, which leaves the voice in a, an impaired position. And I'm saying by direct voice rehabilitation, you can get a normal, efficient voice, and you don't have to use an extraneous, invasive procedure. That's the difference. And I think the only issue, really, that comes to the fore is not whether you use the surgery or the baculum or the direct voice rehab, is whether you give the patient options and the alternatives to decide what he or she wants to do. That, I think, is the real issue. Well, I agree. I think patients should be have well-informed consent about all the different forms of treatment because, mm -hmm. let's face it, nothing is, is always 100% successful in these cases. These are all complicated patients. Yes. They all have a number of different problems that, that focus in on the, the mm -hmm. problem that they're exhibiting, namely struggling mm -hmm. and kind of an inability to get the words out. And really a multidisciplinary approach in terms of a voice therapist, and uh, a, a medical doctor, um, I think sometimes